Good morning, everyone. I think uh, the audience uh, is aspirants for GRF, SRF, as well as NET ERS exams. So today, what we'll discuss in this e-training course on ICR, GRF, SRF, NET ERS exam, uh, uh, organized by MPK Virahuri, that is these topics have been assigned. There is content, uh, concept of land, soil, and soil science, composition of earth crust, and its relationship with soils, rocks and minerals, its classification, genesis description, and their weathering. It is weathering of rocks and minerals. Now, basically, this is a training program, and this is not a course or a theory class with course. So, though I will discuss some theory and some concept, but we should actually, I will be more focusing on how to have your approach right for a particular competitive examination, which are GRF, SRF, and ARS. That means what to read, what to remember, and where to focus, actually. So let us first start with land, soil, and soil science. What is land? Land, it is a bigger entity. It's a comprehensive entity that contains soil, all living organisms that are staying on that land air and water bodies within or on it, and the rocks below that land. All these things are part of land. And soil is basically just a part of land. So soil and land are not same. Land is a bigger entity, which encompasses many things, like these things. Whereas soil is a part of land, very important part with respect to agriculture point of view and many other things. The soil has been defined by different experts differently. Geologists have defined soil in some other, some terms. Engineers have defined in other terms. Pedologists have defined in other terms. Agriculturalists, we have other agenda for soil. So based on the use of the soil, Humans have defined it as per their own requirement. So initially, the soil, this term comes from the Latin word sola, which means floor. Whitney, in 1892, called it a nutrient bean. That means soil is something that contains sufficient amount of nutrients for plant growth. He emphasized it like that. According to geologists, product of rock weathering, soil is a product of rock weathering, a superficial form, unconsolidated material. Unconsolidated means loose fab. A rock is consolidated mass. If you break the rock, it becomes unconsolidated. That means fragments. So a superficial unconsolidated material of earth crust that they must quarry before reaching the material of their interest. According to engineers, any unconsolidated material removed in excavation and used for tilling or providing foundation for structures, including the regolith as well. So as per geologists and engineers, they have defined soil as the soil we see from the surface, as well as those fragmented materials which are being disintegrated from the rocks. Together, they have called it soil because they actually do not care about what is present in the soil, what microorganisms are present in the soil, whether soil is a living entity or not, whether soil provides nutrients for plants or not, they do not bother about that. So what they have for geologists, until they get the material of their interest that drops, they drops. Before that, everything is soil for them. For, them. for engineers, anything unconsolidated that they can use or excavate, during their construction activities, there is soil. But for us, this is not the soil actually. The soil definition for us is something different. And the soil definition for us, that is for agriculturists, or soil scientists belong to agriculture. It starts here. A mixture of us, uppermost mantle of weather, rock, and organic matter. Somewhat we are entering into it. So there must be organic matter along with weather, rock, and excluding the regolith. Regolith means only the broken rocks, that means unconsolidated material made up from the rocks. When the rocks get disintegrated, 
and they form this regolith. But excluding the rock, the uppermost way that part, along with organic matter, more comprehensive definition, more or less loose and chiral material in which plants, here Hilgard has considered also plants. Plants, by means of their roots, find a foothold for nourishment as well as for other conditions of growth. Soil is a natural body of earth material, strongly different from all other natural bodies, possessing remarkable life-giving qualities as per pedologists. So pedologists have defined it like that. A natural body of earth material, strongly different from all other natural bodies. Next comes very important Doku shape. Please try to remember this. Doku shape called soil as a natural body. Doku shape called soil as a natural body composed of mineral and organic constituents. Mineral and organic constituents having a definite genesis and a distinct nature of its own. So basically, this distinct nature of its own means strongly different from all other natural bodies. This means actually this. Please try to remember, Doku Shep told, soil is a natural body composed of mineral and organic constituents having a definite genesis and a distinct nature of its own. Jenny, 1941. This is also very important because this definition gives you all the five factors of soil condition. Jenny called soil a naturally occurring body that has been evolved going to combined influence of climate and organisms acting on parent material as conditioned by relief. Relief means topography over a period of time. So all the five factors of soil formation are in this definition, among which climate and organisms are active factors and parent material, relief and time are passive factors. According to soil physicists, they call soil a heterogeneous, polyphasic, particulate, disperse, and porous system in which the interfacial area or unit volume can be very large. So definitely soil is a three-dimensional natural body. Please also try to remember this. Soil is a three-dimensional natural body. As per Soil Science Society of America, glossary of soil science terms, soil is a is the unconsolidated material on the immediate surface of the earth that serves as a natural medium for growth of land plants. If it is only unconsolidated, then we will not call it soil. It must serve as a natural medium for growth of land plants. Now, please try to remember another thing. Study of soil as a medium for plant growth is called ethnology. Study of soil genesis, study of soil classification and survey, all these things come under pedology. Whereas study of soils as a medium for plant growth comes under edaphology. The unconsolidated mineral matter on the surface of the earth that has been subjected to and influenced by genetic and environmental factors of and material, climate, including moisture, temperature, macro and microorganisms, and topography, all acting over a period of time and producing a product that is soil. So first, there is unconsolidated material forming from the rocks. That unconsolidated material is actually regolith, or you can also say parent material, on which different factors will act upon, and they will form the true soil. Now this soil that differs from the material from which it is derived in physical, chemical, biological, and morphological properties and characteristics. From the parent material, the soil must differ in all these four terms, physically, chemically, biologically, and morphologically. So regolith. Regolith is basically the loose, unconsolidated, inorganic material. There is no, there is no organic something, okay? In regolith, there is nothing organic. Loose unconsolidated inorganic material of the way that draw on the earth's surface, result of disintegration and decomposition of the exposed bedrock, also considered as parent material of soil. Now, this is basically a confusing term. In many literature, they have considered regolith as the parent material. 
However, in some literatures, they have considered regolith as the yeah, parent material as the upper more weathered part of regolith as parent material. So questions may come that unconsolidated and more or less biochemically weathered mineral material from which soils are developed. If it is written that from which soils are developed, you and if you find an uh, option, parent material, you pick the parent material. If it only comes, then lose an unconsolidated inorganic material of weather drop on the earth surface, then you tick on regolith. So rocks, they undergo weathering to form regolith, which are unconsolidated. Now rocks are consolidated. Consolidated means a single mass. Now, unconsolidated means if they are broken down into smaller pieces. So, unconsolidated material may be derived from the underlying bedrock and may, may have been transported by action of water, wind, or ice. Now, from bedrock, whenever the regolith is formed due to weathering, that may stay there and form the soil. Or else, they also may be transported to somewhere else and form the soil at that place. So regolith could form soil in situ and they could form soil ex situ after transportation. So on regolith, soil forming factors and processes will act and will form the true soil, which is the upper biochemically weathered part of the regolith. High, high organic matter, it has high organic matter, it has abundance of roots. There is no roots in regolith, there is no organic matter in regolith. Okay? And it is more intense weathering can be seen in soil as compared to regolith because Further weathering and soil forming process, act, act, acting of soil forming process leads to soil. And you will find distinct horizontal layering, distinct genetic horizons like O, A, E, B, like these genetic horizons you will find in the soil, which you will not find in the regolith. So, plant material unconsolidated and more or less biochemically weathered mineral material from which soils are developed is called parent material. Now another term, can you see this soil individual and paid on this slide, students? Yes, sir. Okay. So please try to understand this term, soil individual. Now defining soil individual is not as simple as defining a human individual or an animal individual or something. Because humans, animals, they are discrete entities. You can see one human, you can see other human, you can see other human. You can see one cat, another cat, another cat, like that one dog, another dog, another dog. So they are individuals. But in soil, you will not find here it is a soil. And again, some, somewhere else it is a soil and in between there is nothing. No, it is not like that. So defining soil individual is a bit difficult. Soil individual, is also known as polypedon. We'll start with polypedon and we'll go to pedon. Okay. So first you remember this soil individual is also known as polypedon. Now, what is a polypedon, which can be called a soil individual? Now you take this landscape, okay, and suppose this carved, carved out portion, this one, which is which has been zoomed out here is a polypedon. You assume that this is a polypedon. Now this polypedon is a soil individual where all the pedons that have made up this polypedon have similar characteristics and will respond similarly to a particular set of management practices. Now here you can see the problem. If this is a polypedon or a soil individual, Adjacent to it, there could be another soil individual. This is the boundary. Say this is the boundary. Okay. Here again, another soil individual. This is the boundary. So soil individual basically is made up of number of pedons, multiple pedons. So it is polypedon. Many pedons, polypedon. Multiple pedons, and within this soil individual. The characteristics are similar, not exactly same. It cannot be exactly same because you are not manufacturing it in the factory. These are being manufactured in the nature itself. So 
slight variations are there, slight uh, spatial variations. So characteristics are more or, less, more or less similar, similar to the extent that they respond similarly to similar management practices. And outside that soil individual, in another soil individual, they will respond differently to similar management practices. So a natural unit of soil that differs from its adjoining units on the landscape in one or more properties to such a degree that the combination of all properties result in different responses to management. Now, you can see a simple diagram here. This is polypetal A, this is polypetal B, this is polypetal C. This is the same boundary. Okay, now, in polypetal A, there are many pedons. In polypetal B, there are again many pedons. And in polypetal C, there are again many pedons. Now, all the pedons in polypetal A have, A have more or less similar properties. And they respond to a particular management practice similarly. Whereas the response to management practices in polypedon A is different, that is significantly different from that the, from the response observed in polypedon B. And that is again significantly different from the polypedon C. And polypedon C's response to a particular management practice is again different from that of polypedon A. All these are soil individuals. Polypedons and soil individual is made up of a number of pedons. Pedon, the smallest volume that can be called a soil. This is a pedon. Okay. This is a three dimensional body. Also called a unit of soil sampling. Must be large enough volume to be observable and to exhibit a full set of horizons. You should be able to uh, get a full set of horizons out of this in the pedon. And it's a three dimensional body. So conceptually, this definition is very clear. Soil individual made up of many pedons. So it is a polypedon. Soil individual is also known as polypedon. Polypedon made up of pedons and pedon is this, the smallest unit volume that can be called a soil. So please remember, this might come, the smallest volume that can be called a soil is called a pedon, okay? Now, in reality, what happens is this boundary of a polypedon is not so sharp. That means the variation in soil properties, it is not so abrupt that up to this properties are similar. Then again, just beyond this boundary, the properties are entirely different. This is not the case in field. In field, defining a polypedon is very difficult because the Properties will change gradually. The change in every property will be very gradual unless there is some uh, very conspicuous or very peculiar type of uh, event occurs, say sudden water logging or something, or sudden you know, high altitude or something. Otherwise, if the slopes and other things are similar, then the Properties, they change, the variations in properties are very gradual, not so sharp. This is the problem in actual field while doing this soil individual. Conceptually, it looks good. So, soil individual, once you have defined this pedon, you can define this soil individual as contiguous similar pedons bounded on all sides by not soil or by pedons of unlike characters. Contiguous means touching, touching each other, the pedons touching each other. So here the pedons touching each other, contiguous and similar. They are similar, more or less similar, similar in terms of that they respond similarly to a particular set of management. And their boundary should be where where there is not soil, not soil means anything else, anything else than soil, say water body comes or something. Or pedons of unlike characters. That means another soil individual starts, till another soil individual starts, where the pedons have different characteristics and they respond differently to management practices. So please try to remember soil individual is polypedon, contiguous similar pedons bounded on all sides by not soil or by pedons of unlike characters. 
whereas pedol is the smallest volume that can be called the soil. Now soil profile, soil sonar and soil sigram. Soil profile is a vertical exposure of a superficial portion of the earth's crust that includes not only all the rares that have been pedogenically altered during the period of soil formation, but also deeper layers that influence pedogenesis. So if you dug, dig a hole and make a section in the soil up to the bedrock, so it is a vertical exposure you will get. Okay, and this exposure will help you to actually characterize the soil, entire soil, based on the profile characteristics. And it will have all the soil horizons as well as the parametrial C or regolith and the bedrock. So soil profile has all these things. Please try to remember this. Soil profile has all these things. Whereas solum is that part of soil profile up to which there are plant root activities. Incomplete soil profile, genetic soil developed by soil bending forces. The maximum rooting depth of perennial plants can be considered as the lower limit of the solar. The depth up to which perennial plants extend their roots. Beyond solar, there is no root activity. The part of the soil profile which is influenced by plant roots. Now, why I am emphasizing on these things so much? Please try to remember this in ICR, SRF, JRF, or ARS exams. No rocket science will be asked. You will be asked very basic and very simple questions. But you should not be confused. You should not get confused at the exam hall whether soil profile included all up, all up to this R or whether soil solum is where up to this plant roots or something. So some key words will be there in the question itself. And from that, you have to identify what they are actually asking. If they are asking that a vertical section, which is a vertical section of soil, which is influenced by plant roots, you will not write soil profile, you will write soil solum. And if they ask a vertical exposure of superficial portion of soil, that not only includes that this portion also, the portion below this, that is where, which has influenced the soil formation, you will call it soil profile. And a three-dimensional body, smallest unit of soil that can be called a soil, so it, which is a pedon, like that. Very easy questions will come, but if you get confused and just clear your mind, there could be problems. Soil sequum, vertical sequum, sequum means squares, continuum. Vertical sequum of properties can be vertically, in vertical sequum is there, and horizontal sequum is there. Vertical sequum means as you go downward, different distribution of everything, as you go downward. Vertical sequum of properties from soil surface or contact with the area to a depth of geological material, up to this depth. And later sequum, a lateral sequum is a succession of contiguous soil bodies in a horizontal direction from the soil body in question. So, Lateral spread. So please try to remember at least soil profile and soil solum. Okay. Next is what is soil science? The science dealing with soil as a natural resource on the surface of the earth, including pedology, which is soil genesis classification and mapping, physical, chemical, biological, and fertility properties of soils and their relation to the management practices for crop production is soil science which has multiple branches. Pedology, covers genesis, survey classification, soil physics, all the physical properties, soil chemistry, all the chemical properties are being dealt with like PHEC, nutrients, like this, uh, the adsorption, desorption, all those things. Soil biology, both uh, any living organism residing in soil will be dealt with. Soil fertility, mostly the Nutrient availability part, nutrient availability to plants. What are the conditions of the soil that will support different kinds of crops? All those things will come under soil fertility. Soil conservation, that means uh, protecting the soil from say erosion, runoff and all those things. So these are the branches of soil science. So this is all about the first part 
and these are the probable questions can you see these probable questions students yes sir okay yes, sir. so unconsolidated first question unconsolidated more or less biochemically weathered mineral material from which soils are developed is known as parent material parent material good 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 a natural unit of soil that differs from its adjoining units on the landscape in one or more properties polypedon polypedon yes the smallest volume that can be called a soil pedon 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 good A vertical cut in the soils that exposes the genetic layers or horizons. Profile. Profile. Good, good, good. The wordings may be different. Different. Okay. The wordings in the questions that you will face may be different, but the basic concept will be same. The part of the soil profile which is influenced by plant roots. Tolum. 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 Branch of soil science dealing with genesis and classification of soils. Pedology. Pedology. Branch of soil science dealing with soil as a medium for plant growth. Ceridaphology. Ceridaphology. <laughs> Next, move on to the crust. We'll see the composition of crust. But what is crust? If you cross section the art. It will look like this. It has crust, then mantle, then core, then inner core. This is outer core and inner core. Okay. The crust on the crust we have the soil. As on the crust we have the soil, and we are doing our business on the soil. So our main interest is in the crust, on the core, on the mantle, or the uh, inner core or something. Even then, we should at least know some things like. Crust thickness is this, like eleven kilometer in the oceans, thirty-five to fifty-six kilometer in the continents. Density, two point six to three point zero gram per centimeter cube. Mantle thickness is this much, two nine zero zero kilometer. Density three to four point five gram per centimeter cube. Core thickness is three five zero zero kilometer. Density nine to twelve gram per. Composition iron and nickel. Please try to remember at least this. Composition of core, iron and nickel. Outer core is melted iron and nickel. Inner core is solid iron and nickel. Okay. Outer core is melted iron and nickel. Inner core is solid iron and nickel. And just to have a comparison with the commonly found things, density of earth as a whole is five point five gram per centimeter. and density of most commonly available rocks on the earth crust is around 2.6 to 2.7 g per cm the heaviest rock on earth could be say 4 to 5 g per cm and density of earth as a whole based on all this is this now you can see one thing the crust density is this much mantle density is this much core density is this so as you go from crust to core the density increases now this is the most important part in crust that is what is the elemental composition of our crust rocks in our crust and rocks in upper plate limited of the earth crust so first let us have elemental composition of our crust this is the elemental composition of our 46.6% oxygen 27.72% silicon 8 around 8% aluminium 5% iron 3 to 3.6% calcium 2.8% sodium 2.59% potassium uh, around 2% magnesium and 1.4% other things now if you can remember this percentage values well, is okay so but if you cannot remember then also there will be no problem at least you try to remember the sequence from most abundant to least abundant okay most abundant is oxygen then you silicon aluminum iron calcium so potassium magnesium questions may be asked what is the most abundant element in earth crust what is the second most abundant element in earth crust what is the most abundant metal in earth crust what is the second most abundant metal in earth crust like that So to remember this one memory con that we used to 
यूज इन आवर टाइम्स इज ओसी एल्फी कैनक एम जी ओसी एल्फी कैनक एम जी यू कैन सी दैट ओ सी एल फी कैनक एम जी ओसी एल्फी कैनक एम जी If you can just remember that, you will remember that oxygen is the highest. Then silicon, then aluminium, then iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. Okay. So discreetly, you may not be able to remember, or you may get confused during the exam. So try to remember this O C O C L P and A K M G. Now rocks in earth crust. If you take the whole earth crust, then ninety five percent is igneous. And five percent is sedimentary. Now, this igneous also takes into account the metamorphic rocks that have been found from this igneous rock. And this five percent sedimentary also takes of account of the metamorphic rocks that have been found from sedimentary rocks. So, igneous rocks and the metamorphic rocks formed from the igneous rocks on, uh, consist of consist around ninety five percent of the earth's crust. Whereas sedimentary and the metamorphic rocks formed from those sedimentary rocks consist five percent of the earth crust. However, our more interest is in the upper portion. Rocks in upper five kilometer of earth crust is seventy four percent sedimentary, eighteen percent igneous, and eight percent others. In this seventy four percent sedimentary, highest is shells fifty two percent, then sandstones fifteen percent, limestones and dolomites seven percent. Granite fifteen percent, basalt three percent, other three. In the upper five kilometer of the sedimentary rocks are most dominant. Out of which shells are most dominant? <coughs> Interact crust, igneous rocks, most dominant. And as element, oxygen is the most dominant. Then most dominant silicon. As these two form around seventy five percent. So most of the rocks and minerals are made up of silicates. As silicon and oxygen are the most abundant and made up of made make seventy five percent around seventy five percent of the earth crust, so the minerals and rocks that we find are mostly made up of silicates, SiO four, made up of SiO four tetrahedra. So in this part, the probable questions would be density of earth as a whole. Five point five. Good. Most abundant element in earth crust. Oxygen. Most abundant metal in earth crust. Aluminium. Aluminium. Feldspar. Feldspar. Most Aluminium. abundant metal. Feldspar is not a metal. Okay. Feldspar is. Yes. Uh, most abundant metal in earth crust. Aluminium. Which category of rocks Aluminium. is dominant in earth crust? Sedimentary. No. Which category of rocks is dominant in the earth's crust? Igneous. Igneous. The most dominant rock in the upper five kilometer of the earth's crust. Sand. Sand. Good. Next comes minerals and rocks. Minerals are naturally occurring homogeneous element or inorganic compound. As a definite chemical composition, characteristic geometric form. Most minerals are composed of two or more elements. For example, gypsum, olivine. Some minerals may comprise of only one element. For example, copper, calcium, carbon, sulfur, maybe gold. Rocks. Hard mass of mineral matter comprising two or more rock-forming minerals. Most rocks are composed of two or more minerals. For example, granite is. Some are made up of one mineral. For example, olivinite, dunite. Now, this I have taken from this uh, Shegel's book. This this is a very important uh, table, which actually classifies the minerals based on four types. This as per their quantity, mode of origin, specific quantity, chemical compounds. Quantity, based on quantity, essential and accessory. Essential means forms the major part of the rocks. Essential means for a rock, it is, forms the major part of the rocks and are instrumental in giving the rock its name. Occur in quantities varying from ninety-five to ninety-eight percent. For example, calcite. Accessory minerals means 
apart from that essential mineral that is present 99.85%, there are some other minerals also, which is 25%, the rest amount, that will be called as accessory mineral. Occurring subsidiary amount, for example, apatite, pyrite, magnetite. Based on mode of origin, primary, secondary. Primary, when formed from crystallization of magma, the molten mass comes up, um, comes out, and if it crystallizes, forms minerals, they will be primary minerals because they are forming initially. They are the first to form. These minerals are the first to form. So, mica, unblend, watch, secondary minerals form due to decomposition and alteration of primary minerals. Clay minerals. So once these primary minerals undergo disintegration and decomposition, they form secondary minerals. Based on specific gravity, some minerals are light and some minerals are heavy. Now, light and heavy, these are two arbitrary terms. You have to define a threshold beyond which on view, below which you have to define them. So, minerals having specific gravity below 2.8 have been considered as light minerals. For example, quartz, feldspar, muscovite, mostly the silicate minerals, aluminum silicate minerals, especially the allosilicates and technosilicates, okay? because they really contain any iron manganese like those heavy elements and they are light. Heavy minerals, specific gravity more than 2.85. Very important exam uh, examples. Pyroxenes, unblendy, olivine, all these things. Matite, pyrite. So above 2.85, heavy minerals. Below 2.85, Light minerals. What is a light mineral? Feldspar is a light mineral. Micas, light mineral. Chemical composition. Based on chemical composition, you can have sanity elements, oxides, hydroxides, sulfates, sulfides, carbonates, halides, silicates. Right? From your terms of composition, you can just classify them. Now, we'll discuss this minerals based on the mode of formation. Primary formed due to crystallization of molten magma. Most abundant elements on earth crust, as you know, oxygen and silicon combined to form. Uh, some uh, spelling mistake is there, typing mistake. This is combined to form. Okay, combined to form silicate minerals. There are the 90% of minerals in earth crust are silicates because this oxygen and silicon, they are most abundant. For example, olivine, pyroxene, and fuel, mica, quartz, feldspar, etc. Secondary, formed by weathering of the pre-existing mineral, material, primary minerals under variable conditions of temperature and pressure. Most common are clay minerals, elite, monoclonite, kaolinite, iron aluminum oxides. In arid and semi arid regions, gypsum, calcite, autobaldite, batite. So these are some of the minerals. This table is also in the Segal's book, but you do not have to remember the entire table. Just remember, these repeating units. Now we will discuss these repeating units in in our upcoming slides. You will be able to understand why these repeating units are like this. I think you already know. Even then, we will discuss. Color. You just remember this. Try to remember this. Olive green, green, fine. Dark green, white, like that. The color you try to remember. After that, if your brain permits, then you can also remember the last chart. But very unlikely that they will ask the last term. Very likely that they can ask the colors. Cleavage, very unlikely. They will not ask. Specific gravity, they will not ask as such, except for some specific minerals. Say for quartz, they may ask. Some feldspars, they may ask. And they may ask whether it is a heavy metal, a heavy mineral, or a light mineral, like that. So for every element you do not, for every mineral, you do not have to remember this. Or some like this underlined, you may remember this, or at least you remember what are the light and what are the heavy minerals. Try to remember this: the non uh, the ferromagnesians are heavy. In the non ferromagnesians, mostly they are light minerals. Ferromagnesian means they contain both eras, uh, iron and magnesium. Also known as mafic. Okay, magnesium, ma, ferric, fic. Mafic. 
alters to what they altered to chances of asking this is also very less so the most important part in this table is which are the light winners and which are the heavy winners and what are the colors and maybe the repeating units these things they will ask watch this structure number 2.65 if the 2.56 and 2.65 would be a better value for this the quad specific gravity is around 2.65 if 2.65 is in the option you take 2.65 if if it is not there and you find 2.56 then you take 2.5 So the scale is to gray, vitreous and glassy. These two. That means the luster and color. You can remember this. Most resistant mineral. Quartz is the most resistant mineral. Some important secondary minerals: clay minerals, for example, hydrous aluminium silicates with layers stru structure similar to mica, like magnesium. Non-silicates: oxides, hydroxides, oxyhydrates, oxyhydrogen, aluminium, and iron. All these things. You can you try to remember the. formula everything or, or at least these things if some epatite a dolomite calcite um, gibbsite boethite limonite then hematite at least try to give the formula because they might may I might ask the formula or they might might give the formula and ask you what is the mineral here or they may also ask uh, that uh, iron containing mineral and they will give options like hematite calcite dolomite gypsum like that in that case you have to take the matter they may ask uh, sulfur containing mineral and uh, give options like calcite dolomite gypsum and apatite like that they might con uh, they might uh, ask you phosphate p containing mineral then and we give you these four uh, options you have to choose apatite okay now if i ask you aranarkite is a mineral containing which elements potassium ammonium phosphorus sulfur what it will we will you choose actually for taranakite anyone if there is in, in the options there is potassium ammonium phosphorus and say sulfur after this class please go into the look into the formula for potassium taranakite as well as ammonium taranakite and you decide on yourself that how to answer that question now silicates we'll discuss silicates in detail because this actually is the base of everything if you understand the silicates properly other things you will understand properly so there are different kinds of silicates this picture may appear a kind of overwhelming to you because uh, so many silicates are there clumsy isolated tetrahedron double tetrahedron tetrahedral ring then chain double chain or then your infinite tetrahedral network dimensional now let us take them one by one silicates are made up of you know silicon and oxygen one silicon can bond with four oxygens and oxygen anions as they are the most abundant they and along with the silicon after that aluminum and iron, iron because those are the most abundant they form most of the minerals oxygen is the most abundant element and oxide is the most abundant anion when this an oxide anions they pack they pack in close packing arrangement which is the most space efficient packing close packing there are two types of close packing hexagonal close packing and cubic close packing. both are equally space efficient now if n number of oxygen pack then they will form n number of tetrahedral holes and uh, sorry two n number of number of tetrahedral holes and two n number of uh, 
I forgot just now. I, I will clarify it. Whenever oxygen ions are actually packing, they form some tetrahedral and octahedral holes. The number I have to check. You can also check. And on, on those holes, you will find some positive ions, say silicon or aluminium or say iron, like that. In tetrahedral holes, mostly silicon, sometimes the silicon may be replaced by aluminium. And in octahedral holes, mostly aluminium and or maybe in magnesium and aluminium may be replaced by say uh, iron or maybe magnesium or even any monovalent cation. So let us start with these silicates. What is mesosilicate? It is one <coughs> tetrahedra. One tetrahedra, another tetrahedra, those are disjoint. There is no sharing of oxygen between different tetrahedra. In mesosilicates, there is no sharing of oxygens. They are isolated. All the tetrahedra are isolated. And the unit composition is SI over minus how? Because you have one silicon and which is bound to four oxygen atoms. So SiO4. Now SiO4 4 minus oxygen has two minus. So four into two minus eight minus, and this has four plus, so four minus. So examples are olivine, pyrite, phosphorite, <coughs> zircon, garnet, all these things. So these are actually different tetrahedra which are bound together by cations like magnesium, iron. Now, there is no sharing of oxygen between one tetra, between two adjacent tetrahedra. In sorosilicate, this could be also dry, di or trisilicate. That means there could be two tetrahedra bearing one oxygen among them, or three tetrahedra bearing here one oxygen and again here one oxygen. So there could be either two or three tetrahedra, not more than that, never more than that. These are so silicates. For example, hemimorphite, benitonite, acarmetite. It's not bentonite, okay? it is benitonite. Bentonite is entirely different thing. Bentonite is monoponionite rich natural deposit. So, questions may be asked. What is the oxygen sharing in nesosilicate? It is none, zero, nil, no oxygen sharing in nesosilicates. Sorosilicates, one oxygen or maybe two oxygen maximum. And soro and meso, both of them are basically isolated. They are not infinite. So they are also known as orthosilicates or even island silicates. They are also called island silicates. They are separate, like islands. Islands are separate and they are not actually combined with the actual mass of the mainland. So they are isolated. <coughs> Next is cyclosilicates. In cyclosilicates, each of the tetrahedra shares two oxygen atoms. Please remember this. Each of the tetrahedra shares two oxygen atoms with its adjacent tetrahedra. You can find this, this tetrahedra. This is sharing one oxygen here and one oxygen here. This is a three dimensional structure. If you can draw this like this, this is very simple. The blue dots are the silicons and the black, dot, black circles are the oxygens. And these green lines actually show the bonds. Now this, this uh, broken black line, this broken black circle, broken circle is also oxygen. That is the above. That is present on the above of the silicon here. If the silicon is here, the oxygen is here. You are, say, uh, observing it from the above. So you have this tetrahedron, which is sharing one oxygen with this and one oxygen with this. Again, this tetrahedron, one oxygen with this and one oxygen with this. But the rest of the two oxygens are not being shared. So the oxygen sharing in cyclosilicates is two per tetrahedra. Each tetrahedra will share two oxygen atoms with its adjacent tetrahedra. Please remember this. Now, 
if you try to formulate the unit composition you just see this how many silicates uh, silicons are there one two three four five six five six how many oxygen are there one two three four five six seven eight nine uh, 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 so there are 18 oxygen atoms for six silicon for every six silicons there are 18 and this this actually do not bond with any other okay this is an entire unit another unit could be here another unit could be here but as they are all negatively charged they will repulse each other so in between them some cations will be there like beryllium aluminium like these things so though they will uh, help they will hold these units okay so these oxygens are not shared so these are not infinite this is a complete structure another complete structure could be here another complete structure could be here and in between there could be there will be some cations which will bind them together so the oxygen sharing in cyclosilicates to unit composition si6 o18 and if you just do the math you will find 12 minus examples beryl tourmaline graphite please try to remember this beryl is beryllium content beryllium content mineral beryl boron containing mineral primary source of boron in soil tourmaline extremely important question boron containing tourmaline graphite contains magnesium okay magnesium containing cyclos graphite but more important is most important is here is tourmaline tourmaline is a cyclosilicate which contains boron primary source of boron is soil next comes inosilicates you know means chain you know, silicates are two types, single chain and double chain. You can see here, this is single chain. You can see here, it is a double chain. Single chains are called pyroxenes. Double chains are called amphibones. Okay. Now, single chain unit composition is this. Double chain unit composition is this. Example, hypersthene dioxide augite. At least you try to remember augite is a pyroxene. There, questions may come, which of the following is a, you know, a single chain inosilicate? Options could be there, pyroxene, you take pyroxene. If option is organic, you take organic. And in double chain, they are hard, <coughs> tremolite, actinolite, and hornblende. Now, how these unit compositions are like this, we'll see in the next slides. Now, you take the pyroxene, that is single chain. Single chain means one tetrahedra, another tetrahedra, one tetrahedra, another tetrahedra. They just link side by side. The tetrahedra link side by side by sharing oxygens to form a chain length that can end at any point. Now, this is a part of the tetrahedra. This shares this oxygen with this. This again shares this oxygen with this tetrahedra. This is another tetrahedra. This is another tetrahedra. This is another tetrahedra. This is another tetrahedra. Like this, it extends in a particular direction. So now the number of units could be anything basically. The number of units could be anything like that. This chain might end after n such tetrahedra. This chain might end after 20 such tetrahedra. This chain might end after 100 such tetrahedra. So that lateral expansion is not and that is why it is termed as N here, this N written. Now, how the unit composition is SI03? Because this is the unit. If you just cut it here from this, this U is the, you will get this. So, if you just put it like in the vertical position, upright and downright, upright and downside, the upright and down, up and down, up and down, then you will get this. So this is actually repeating. This is actually repeating in this length. So how? What will be the formula? You have one silicon, one oxygen, two oxygen, and half of two oxygens. So here half, here half. So total three oxygens. One silicon, three oxygen. SiO3, or maybe SiO2O6. SiO3 or SiO2O6. 
SiO3 2 minus n. n means the number of this unit is not defined. It may end at 10, it may end at 20, it may end at 30, it may end at 100. That is why it is called infinite length. Infinite length, single chain, and this is a single chain. Silly. I don't say this. All right, hypersthin and dioxide. Now double chain. Just put another chain, chain below it. In pyroxene, another thing you just remember, what is the oxygen sharing? Can anyone tell? Sharing of oxygens? Two oxygen sharing. Yes. Here, the oxygen sharing is two, like cyclosilicate. But in the cyclosilicate, they are ending the chain by forming a circle. Here, the chain is not ending and it is expand it is literally expanding just expanding and expanding anywhere if land now the oxygen sharing is two in empty balls you just put another change below it another change similar chain just below it another similar chain in this case the oxygen sharing is funny this tetrahedra all the outer tetrahedra they share two oxygens and all the inner tetrahedra Inward tetrahedra, they share three oxygens. Alternately, two and three. The oxygen sharing is alternately two, then three. Two, then three. How? This outward tetrahedra, they sh it shares this oxygen and this oxygen. This inward tetrahedra, tetrahedron, shares this oxygen as well as this oxygen as well as this oxygen. So the oxygen sharing is alternately two and three. And what is the repeating unit? You cut it here. Cut it here. Just cut it into half like that. And you take anything inside this red lines. Anything inside these broken red lines. So you have one of silicon, two silicon. Half silicon, half silicon, half silicon, half silicon. So two half, get yeah, two half. So two. And two, four, SI four. And oxygens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Plus half, 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 half. Here also half, here also half, here also half, here also half. So half of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Half of eight oxygens, that means four oxygens, plus seven. One, two, three, four, five, seven. Eleven oxygens. SI four, four, eleven. Six minus n n because it may again end after say ten or twenty or thirty or forty or hundred even maybe thousand anything anywhere it may end. So it is also called infinite length chain silicon double chain. And people have double chains, pyroxene have single chains. Just one thing you try to remember, the most important or most common example of amphiboles is this horn blend. Horn blend, okay. This may, the questions may be asked that horn blend is dash type of mineral. Options may be nesosilicate, sorosilicate, or say orthosilicate, single chain, double chain, hilo, like that. So try to remember at least horn blend. Next is phyllosilicates. Now, in that chain, you have one chain, you have another chain. In the amphibole, you have one chain, you have two chains, only two chains. No above, nothing below. Nothing above, nothing below. And they expand only in one direction. Only in one direction, they expand. Two chains are expanding only in one direction and they share one oxygen. For each if you just expand them, those double chains in two directions, in X and Y, both like this. This is two chains, another chain you add, then another chain you add below this, another chain you add above this, like that. There's many chains and these are expanding in two directions. They will become highly silicates. Not three directions, they are expanding in two directions. They will become highly silicates. Phylos means sheet. Like sheet, this is a sheet, this, this, this kind of arrangement, like your bed sheet. 
Pilots will shift and they are two dimensionally expanded. Now, this is the unit composition. How it is the unit composition? Let us see here. This is how they expand actually. In phyllosilicates, they expand only in one direction. In phyllosilicates, they expand in this direction as well as this direction, X and Y both, not in Z. Phyllosilicates are limited in Z direction. Please remember this. Phyllosilicates are limited in the C axis. In minerals, they are A, B, and C. One axis. Phyllosilicates expand in A and B dimensions and limited in C dimensions. Limited means they end at C dimension at a particular interval. And that is why they are characterized based on the C axis spacing. Okay, they are not characterized based on B axis spacing or A axis spacing because A and B can go anywhere. But they are characterized based on C axis spacing because they are. C, the vertical dimension is limited and that limitation is based on the structure. They are well defined and under uh, some conditions, they have specific values. So you will be able to identify based on C axis spacing. That is why as phyllosilicates are limited on the C axis spacing or as phyllosilicates are limited on the C axis direction, they are categorized based on C axis spacing or they are identified based on C axis spacing. Now, B dimension is also useful. B dimension is useful to differentiate between bi and tri octahedral minerals. We'll, we'll discuss that. Now, for the time being, you just see the repeating unit. You just cut here. And if you put this unit, which is inside these red lines, in this upper and below, upper and below, upper and below, then you will find the entire allosilicate structure. So in this repeating unit, you have two silicons, one, two, inside two. And how many oxygens? One, two, three, half of four oxygens, this, 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 and this. So half of four oxygens means two oxygens and one, two, three. So five, Si2O5, Si2O1, two, three, four, five. Si2O5, N, N, why this may again end in any direction anywhere? In A and B direction, but in C direction, it will end in a particular, a particular distance. So N means this Si2O5 just expands in X direction and in Y direction. Here, what is the sharing of oxygens? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, what um, we have mentioned here, uh, this. Um, by two lines, this is C dimension. We are considering it C dimension. No, no, no. This is not C dimension actually. This what you are seeing right now. This is A and B. C we we cannot see from the C dimension. We cannot see from this structure. Okay. Then, sir, uh, how we are uh, saying that uh, uh, for seed silicate, uh, we can uh, identify based on C, di C dimension. Yes, sir. How we can conclude formula then? No, 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 no. This is the repeating unit. Okay. This is the repeating unit means how the silicate portion will repeat itself. It is the sheet that is tetrahedral sheet, octahedral sheet. This is a tetrahedral sheet only. Say in my car, you have two tetrahedral sheets, one octahedral sheet. This is one of the tetrahedral sheets. And what is the repeating unit of that tetrahedral sheet? And the C axis dimension, I will come. I will again explain. First, you understand the repeating unit in this tetrahedral sheet. Okay. In this tetrahedral sheet, the repeating unit is Si2O5. How? You, you, could you understand this calculation? Yes, sir. Yes. So, in say mica, you have two tetrahedral sheets, one octahedral sheet. In kaolinite, you have one tetrahedral sheet, one octahedral sheet. This is just a tetrahedral sheet. And this expands in A direction and B direction. The X and Y. X direction and Y direction. Infinitely. At anywhere it can end. But vertical expansion, that means how vertical expansion will be there? You have one tetrahedral sheet above which one octahedral sheet above which one tetrahedral sheet. That's how. Here it has ended. After that you, have, you will have interlayer cations. 
Then again, one tetrahedral sheet, one octahedral sheet, one tetrahedral sheet. In MICA, there will always be two tetrahedral sheets and one octahedral sheet. And the compositions of those tetrahedral as well as octahedral sheet, uh, that means the um, substitutions will also be within a certain range. That is why you will have a certain distance in A and B directions. This, this is a, a direction in this, and this is a B direction. It can go anywhere, anywhere. It can stop after 10, it can stop after 20, it can stop after 30, anywhere. So you cannot identify one phyllosilicate from other phyllosilicate based on A or B dimension, because in any phyllosilicate, this A and B dimension will go anywhere. But in C dimension, one phyllosilicate is different from another phyllosilicate. Because in mica, say you have two is two one, that means two tetrahedral layers and one octahedral layer. Each of those layers has some thickness, specific thickness. The thickness is specific. Because one tetrahedral layer, in one tetrahedral layer you, you have you are, it is made up of one silicon and then oxygen. Then again, so silicon and oxygen, which are shared by corner sharing, like that. Uh, tetrahedra share corners, and those corners, after corner sharing, they will form a sheet like structure. But their thickness is defined by the oxygen and the silicon. Because in between the hole, you have silicon, and above and below, you have oxygen. So the thickness is defined. If your sheet thickness is defined, and you have three sheets, two tetrahedral sheet and one octahedral sheet. That means that thickness is also defined. And that thickness also depends on the interlayer cation. If, if a particular interlayer cation set for mica is potassium, unhydrated potassium, the potassium also has some diameter that will give that has some specific thickness. So based on that, you can just separate from one to another for kaolinite. There is no interlayer. Here I am. They are uh, held with hydrogen bonds. Like that. But in kaolinite, you have one tetrahedral sheet, one octahedral sheet. And the thickness of the tetrahedral sheet is a particular thickness. It is specific. The octahedral sheet has a particular thickness. So both of them will give you a particular thickness. So in C axis, they are limited. That is why they can be identified from one another. One uh, phyllosilicate can be differentiated from another phyllosilicate based on C axis dimension, but not based on A or B axis dimensions because for both of them, the tetrahedral sheets or even octahedral sheets can go anywhere. Basically. This can uh, expand in this direction up to n, n number and in this direction, n number. Okay. If you just actually draw the phyllosilicates, Mm, the tetrahedral, octahedral, and tetrahedral, and then interlayer cations, different values of this. You will be able to understand why I am calling the C axis because A and B axis can end anywhere. Now, what is the oxygen sharing? That question was uh, my question was what is the oxygen sharing here? Anyone? Hello. Three oxygen sharing. Good. Three of the oxygen. For every tetrahedra, there are three oxygen sharings. Except maybe the one tetrahedra which are exactly present in the edges. At, at, at the terminal, terminal points, if they are present, then uh, this uh, oxygen will not be shared. Otherwise, for every tetrahedra, for every tetrahedron, three oxygen sharing is there. So in phyllosilicates, the oxygen sharing is three. Yes. I think so. Now, please try to remember this box. There are some examples, actually. And these examples are very important for competitive examinations. Mica, twist one non expanding mineral. Biotite is a trioctahedral, black mica. Muscovite, dioctahedral, white mica. Dioctahedral, trioctahedral means? Trioctahedral means all the octahedral positions are filled up with cations. And dioctahedral means two-thirds of the octahedral positions are filled up 
errors. So muscovite, please remember white mica, dioptrical. Biotite, trioptrical, black mica. Glauconite is iron rich, green colored mica. Green sand, also known as green sand, or green sand is basically glauconite rich natural deposit. Question may be asked, what, which of the following is an iron rich green colored mica or green colored mica, like that, you will say glauconite. Which is the white mica, muscovite, which is the black mica, biotite. Uh, or a question may come, which of the following is a twist one non-expanding type mineral, you say mica. Pilite, also twist one non-expanding also known as hydrous mica. The elite is the weathered product of mica when it comes in the clay size fractions. In clay size fractions, any mineral with 10 angstrom C-axis spacing is generally termed as elite. While whereas in sand and silt, if any mineral with 10 angstrom spacing is there, it will be called as mica. But however, in, in nowadays, uh, they are uh, in some literature, they are using clay mica instead of elite. But for your Jared, you try to remember this. Clay sized mica is elite and it was, it is also sometimes called hydrous mica. This is non-expanding. Vermiculite, two is to one, limited expanding. Here is limited expansion. Limited expanding type mineral, two is to one, limited expanding type mineral is vermiculite. Earlier, it was known as hydrobiotite. Smectites. Smectites are twist one expanding type minerals. There are many smectites, montonite, bridelite, nontronite. Nontronite is iron rich. Again, you remember iron rich smectite, nontronite. Lithium containing smectite, ectorite. Very important. Lithium containing. Lithium is used in batteries. So lithium containing minerals, ectorite. Please remember this. Bentonite, what is bentonite? Bentonite is montmillionite rich natural deposit. Okay. Eolinite. 1 is to 1. All the 1 is to 1 and 2 is to 1 is to 1 are non expanding type minerals. Okay. So, kaolinite 1 is to 1. Kaolin is kaolinite fixed natural deposit. Haloisite 1 is to 1 with water molecules in the interlayers. One molecular layer thick. Chloride 2 is to 1 is to 1. 2 is to 1 is to 1 means 2. Tetrahedra in between one octahedra, and in the interlayer positions, instead of cations, there are charged brucite or charged gibbsite layer. Brucite means MgOH2, gibbsite is NOH3. So either charged brucite or charged gibbsite layer will be there in the interlayer positions instead of cations. And they help the twist to one layers very tightly. So they are non expanding, and those interlayers in the chlorides are not accessible by outside cations. Interlayers of kaolinite, not accessible by outside cation. In mica, interlayer cations will be accessible once there is weathering. Weathering will only cause accession. Uh, Otherwise, no cation exchange will be there. But cation exchange in the interlayers can take place of smectites and to some extent in vermiculites. Under moist conditions, under very moist conditions, interlayer cations may be exchanged by cation exchange in vermiculite. And in smectites, even in dry conditions, uh, relatively dry conditions, there could be. So, C axis spacing. Can you see this? This is the basal spacing or C axis spacing. Can you see this table? Yes, sir. I'm sharing a table. Okay. So, this table is in nanometers. Okay. You either remember in nanometers or you remember in angstroms, you can convert it in between. One nanometer is equal to how much angstrom? Ten angstrom. So C axis spacing, as you know that hydrosilicates are made up of silica tetrahedral sheet. Alumina octahedral sheet or magnesium octahedral sheet, there is tetrahedral sheets and octahedral sheets. And they have definite number of sheets or different minerals. For smectite, it is 2 is to 1, vermiculite 2 is to 1, chloride 2 is to 1 is to 1, mica 2 is to 1, and 2 is to 1. Sorry, 1 is to 1. But depending on the interlayer cations and the moisture content, the spacings may vary. 
these are the different conditions there is magnesium saturated air drag magnesium saturated visceral solvate potassium saturated air drag potassium saturated heated at 300 degrees celsius potassium saturated heated at 50 degrees celsius what is important for your exam is this magnesium visceral magnesium saturated visceral solvate is make tight 1.7 1.77 nanometer or say 1.8 nanometer like that it may be there one will write 1.4 or 1.44 chloride 1.43 or maybe 1.4 mica or elite 1.01 uninate 0.715 or 0.71 or maybe 0.72 potassium saturated air drag this question was asked in our srf exam what is the c axis spacing of potassium saturated air drag smectite which is 1.23 or 1.21 Please remember this. And also potassium saturated air dried vermiculite. Potassium saturated air dried vermiculite behaves like mica 1.01. And at K550 degree Celsius, only mineral that will show peak near 1.4 nanometer is chloride. And at that temperature, eulinite gets broken down it decomposes so no peak as it gets decomposed in this table at least you remember the highlighted portions and then you should be able to convert it into any unit if the units are asked in differently in your exams next is tectosilicates in tectosilicates this is the kind of arrangement that means all the oxygens are basically shared just one part of the this uh, here all the oxygens this one this one this one this one are shared that means all the four oxygens are shared and the repeating unit is basically SiO2 for example quartz feldspars semi-side glucide group nephilim trimeride group so like two. now quartz is SiO2 feldspars some SI could be replaced by aluminium. In others also, some SI could be replaced by other catalans. So there also could be replacements in this silicon. And due to that replacement, there are recharging balance and some other catalans will come to uh, get the charge balance. SiO2 zero is the repeating unit for tectosilicates. It has a three-dimensional framework. What are the probable questions from this section? Which of the following is a heavy mineral? Anyone? Amphibole. Good. Which of the following is a secondary mineral? Esmectite. Which of the following is a tectosilicate? Sir, field spar. Good. Which of the following is a boron containing mineral? Tonvaline. Terrible Good. Limits. Good. Which of the following is a twist point mineral? Chloride. Chloride. No. Which Nine of the following is a twist one mineral? Sir, uh, muscovite. Good. Which of the following is a limited expanding mineral? Uh, vermiculite, sir. Vermiculite. Good. Which of the following is a cyclosilicate? Beryl. Beryl. So, another cyclosilicate in this slide? The line. C axis spacing of K saturated air dried smectite. Excuse me, hello. C axis spacing of K saturated air dried smectite. Anyone? 17.8. No, that is magnesium saturated missile mm solvate. -hmm. I just told you that this question came in our SRF exam. This one, 12.3 or maybe in, in options, you may find 12 or 12.1 or maybe 12.3. Okay, anything. Anything near 12, you will take that. The excess spacing of K-saturated, air dry spectrum. If it comes magnesium saturated, lysol solvate is you will put 17.8 or 18 like that. 
if it only asks if the question only asks this, what is the cx spacing of smith tight though the question will be wrong but you have to answer 1.8 nanometer or say 80 angstrom or say like that anything near 80 angstrom okay cx spacing of magnesium saturated glycerol solvated smith tight 17.8 good iron rich mica non non tronite no non tronite iron rich mica non tronite is mectite mineral gloconite good lithium containing phyllosilicate pectorite good repeating unit in phyllosilicates si2052 negative good single chain silicates are pyroxene pyroxene double chain silicates sir um uh, hornblende hornblende is an example but the group amphibols amphibols charged brucite or gibbsite layer is present in chloride chloride it is chloride okay don't confuse it with chloride it is t okay yes. now let us come to fourth section that is rocks minerals are more important from your exam point of view than rocks but rocks are also important petrology science of rocks of earth's crust petrogenesis origin of rocks petrography deals with the description of rocks originally the whole surface of earth passed through a molten stage and the first solid rocks rock was derived from this molten material magma formation cooling and consolidation of magma if they are formed by cooling and consolidation of magma they are called igneous rocks if cementation of fragmentary material in situ or transported then they are called sedimentary rocks alteration of pre existing rocks mostly by high temperature and pressure metamorphic rocks so classification of rocks based on the mode of formation igneous they are formed by cooling and crystallization of molten material that is magma on the on or beneath the earth surface on or beneath the earth surface have no have non laminar massive structure original source of parent material for other rocks and soil sedimentary disintegration and decomposition of pre existing rocks is like fragmentary materials that means once these igneous rocks have formed they will disintegrate and decompose to form fragments and those fragments may again recombine reconsolidate through some cementing agents in situ that means on site it has formed or they may be transported elsewhere and then there if they can get, again get cemented and form other rocks which are sedimentary rocks now this is the fragments from which sedimentary rocks actually form they could come from igneous rocks also the sedimentary rocks themselves could get fragmented and then again form sedimentary rocks okay and these fragments may also come from say metamorphic rocks any any fragment that are being generated by disintegration decomposition of pre existing rocks they cement cemented under pressure and with some cementing agents and they form sedimentary rocks and during transportation or uh, mostly there is layers of these fragments they actually they are be transported and due to the pressure of the upper side the lower sides are actually compacted and cemented so they show stratification sedimentary rocks are also known as stratified rocks please remember this sedimentary rocks are also known as stratified rocks because they show stratification stratification of different materials because in some time the fragmented materials could be of some origin the other fragmented materials above that could be of other origin or like that or maybe the say are size variants or maybe there could be chemical composition variation based on that you can see the strata strata of different layers which are cemented by some cemented material cemented material to form the rocks finally the metamorphic rocks metamorphic means change in form okay sedimentum the sedimentary comes from sedimentum which means settling igneous comes from ignis which means fire igneous from fire sedimentum settling and metamorphic means change in form more or less complete alteration of the original characters of the rocks mostly influenced by heat and pressure So, igneous rocks. 
can be classified based on mode of origin can be classified based on chemical composition based on mode of origin there are two types intrusive or volcanic rocks intrusive or plutonic rocks please try to remember at least the definition of extrusive or volcanic rocks if molten magma is forced out of the earth surface and it comes in direct contact with the atmosphere then it will cool down suddenly it will take much less time to cool down because the above the earth surface the temperature is much less if the molten magma just comes out it will cool down suddenly as it is cooling down suddenly it will not find the time to form large size crystals so it will cool down suddenly form solidify to form fine size crystals very fine size crystals it will form and as the magma has got out of the earth surface that will to the earth surface from the inner portions so say through volcanic eruptions they are called extrusive or volcanic rocks so extrusive volcanic rocks that means the magma has come out cooled out suddenly now how high the magma has come out because due to increase in the pressure in the inner inner portions of the earth so that pressure causes the liquid uh, molten magma to come out and once they have come out in the atmosphere they suddenly cool down and they are not finding the time to form large size crystals so they will form fine size crystals molten magma is forced out of the earth surface by increased pressure in the earth due to certain geological changes loses its volatile substances cools down suddenly solidifies to form fine size crystals a glassy structure basalt trilobite trachyte these are examples sometimes they are vesicular that is full of bubble holes due to volatile constitutions that means the magma has come out while it was solidifying some volatile substances they have uh, escaped and and their escape path actually has formed some pores inside the rocks and such rocks example of such rock is pumice please remember this porous rock or vesicular full of bubble holes is pumice another category intrusive or plutonic rocks when the pressure subsides pressure inside the earth subsides then some of the molten magma will go back within the earth surface the magma starts moving back and when moving back if they solidify actually just below the earth surface within that means within the earth just below the earth surface then the temperature where they are actually solidifying though it is less than the actual temperature of the magma but much more than the Impartial that has been placed in the atmosphere. So due to this high temperature, they will cool down slowly. Due to the higher temperature, they will cool down slowly. And as they are cooling down slowly, they will find sufficient time to form large size crystals. So, if the rock, when the uh, pressure subsides within the earth's surface, the magma starts moving back, cools down to form rocks on its way. If the rocks are formed by solidification of magma within earth's crust, within earth's crust, please remember this. If the rocks are formed by solidification of magma within earth's crust, they are called intrusive rocks or plutonic rocks. Cooling process is slow as it happens within the earth's crust, but temperature is much higher than uh, the on the surface. So they tend to form coarse grain crystals. They tend to form coarse grain crystals because they have sufficient time to form coarse grain crystals. For example, granite gabbro. Now, igneous rocks can be classified based on chemical composition, based on the relative amounts of acid and base components. Now, what are the acid components? Mostly silicic acid or silicic basic components like Na2O, K2O, Yao, MgO, Al2O3, FeO, Fe2O3, like this. These are basic components. Now, acid or oversaturated, neutral or saturated, basic or undersaturated. Undersaturated or oversaturated in terms of silica. If it contains more than sixty percent silica, they are oversaturated with respect to silica, and the rocks tend to be acidic. And under similar conditions, they would uh, result in the formation of acidic soils. However, the way that acidic soils will form or alkaline soils will form will depend more on the climatic conditions rather than the planetary material. Okay, so it cannot be generalized so easily. That thing because climate acts more importantly. On determining the actually whether whether it will be acidic or alkaline soil, then your the actual parent material that was present. So acid or oversaturated, oversaturated with respect to silica. More than sixty percent silica, 
ऑर्गेनिक ग्रानाइट कोनालाइट ट्रायलाइट डाइक्लोराइड न्यूट्रल और सैचुरेटेड कॉन्टेक्स के 360% से लेगा साइनाइड डायोराइड ट्राइगाइट एंड डिसाइट बेसिक और अंडर सैचुरेटेड मींस लेस देन 50% से लेगा तो रेस्ट ऑफ द अमाउंट और रेस्ट अमाउंट इज फिल्ड अप बाय बेसिक कंपोनेंट्स फॉर एग्जांपल बेसाल्ट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट राइट द व्हाट इज व्हिच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज अ basic igneous rock there will be basalt you will write basalt there will be gabbro you will write gabbro which of the following is a acid igneous rock you will write granite okay granite is very common example that may be asked in the question or basalt or gabbro granite basalt and gabbro these are very common examples that may ask that may be asked in questions so if you just uh, combine them based on both of them so volcanic fine grained Acid neutral basic, volcanic coarse grained acid neutral basic. These are the we really try to just try to remember this table because uh, they may ask acid volcanic or neutral volcanic rock. Uh, though chances are less, but they will be asked, especially for air students, not for GR for GR students. What they can ask, uh, uh, which of the following is a basic igneous rock? Which of the following is a acid igneous rock? Like that. So some important igneous rocks. basalt most abundantly formed uh, from uh, magma fine grain dark colored contains 50% plus 50% carbonaceous minerals coarse grain rock with comparable composition is gabbro if it is coarse grain with comparable composition it is gabbro you miss light weight very important is porous you can see the pores these are uh, bubble holes developed due to Volatilize escaping of volatile material of volatilize now volatile materials lightweight uh, as they are porous they, it is lightweight specific gravity is less than water it pours on water composition comparable to granite or rhyolite granite you can see uh, now it is on the labs the labs you can see on the kitchens or you can also see granite granite stones they are putting granite stones there it looks good it is fairly resistant. Granite coarse grained, light colored rock contains this much feldspar, orthoclase, plagioclase, and magnesium quartz. Fine grained rock with similar composition is rhyolite. So these are granites, and colored, these are colored granites are available. These are pumice. This is a basalt rock. So next comes, can you see these four stages of formation of sedimentary rocks? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, my question is: Is there any reason? That uh, silica part acidic nature. No, actually silica. What is silica? What is silicate? Silicate is basically salt of silicic acid. That is why, if they actually hydrolyze, they will form acids. Okay. On the other hand, if you if you have sodium, potassium, and even iron, manganese, or say magnesium, like those elements in large amounts. when the hydrolysis of chemical weathering will be there the hydrolysis will result in more of oh minus as compared to h minus h plus so i will discuss hydrolysis uh, later but for the time being just to answer your question do you know hydrolysis what is hydrolysis as a basic yes, thing yes, what is hydrolysis say you dissolve sodium chloride in water will be, will there be hydrolysis yes sir no There will not be hydrolysis. There will only be hydration of the sodium and chloride ions. If you dissolve sodium hydroxide in soil as in water, then there will be hydrolysis. If you dissolve HCl in water, then there will be hydrolysis. Hydrolysis does not mean the splitting of water or maybe you are dissolving something and it is hydrolyzed. No. Hydrolysis means splitting of water in a reaction where splitting of water takes place and the final result will be either excess of H plus or excess of OH minus. Okay, so if excess of H plus is the final result, then it is creating acidity. If the final result is excess of OH minus, then it is creating alkalinity. Now, if excess of silicate is there and lesser of basic cations are there, and both get hydrolyzed, silicates hydrolyze to form excess of H plus because they will form silicic acid, which will convert into H plus and uh, silicic ions, and in a uh, sodium and the alkaline part there is sodium potassium and uh, say aluminum iron and all those uh, magnesium if they hydrolyze their portion 
if they hydrolyze they will result in excess of oh minus so they will result in basicity that is why if excess of silica is there it is cause it is called as acid and if less of silica is there that means definitely more of basic components will be there so less of silica means more of basic components will be there so something will be there and no organic matter is there so if less of silica is present so more of basic components are present which will hydrolyze to form excess of oh minus in the system that is why they are basic and if there is a balance between these two then both acidity and the alkalinity will be more or less similar amount of will be produced and they are called neutral last chal raha hai abhi baad mein baad mein lagta hai ye darwaza band kar dena did you get my point yes sir so there are four stages of formation of sedimentary rocks uh, now whether in transportation deposition diagenesis i have told you that any rock that may be any pre existing rock that may be disintegrated and decomposed to form uh, um, decomposed to form fragmentary materials or weathered materials now those weathered materials will be transported or may be also in situ they may form or maybe they will be transported by water wind glaciers gravity runoff anything so the dust clouds in dry months uh, carry finer particles dust clouds may also uh, carry something which is called as saltation when saturated with water loose materials on gentle slopes may carry move carry with it well established plants down the slope the process called as polyflocculation or soil clay so basically in sedimentary rock formation the pre existing rocks will be broken down the fragmentary materials will be transported or maybe they will remain there and after which they will be deposited if they are transported they will be deposited where the materials are deposited uh, when the carrying uh, the carrying agents no longer have energy enough to move it further the coarser particles settle first then the finer particles if you see the a river bed in the river beds the coarser particles you will find in the mountains the boulders or something or say large rocks as you go in the plains small and small particles will be there in the plains uh, in normal plains there will be sands that means even smaller particles and at the just at the mouth of the sea will, uh, the silts will be deposited deposited and the clays will even further move and will mix with the ocean water well the clay particles which are initially dispersed but they will actually take up the salts and decrease the their thickness will be really uh, reduced as it is they will be populated and there will be marine deposits that is why if you just say, see a river which is being said ganga which is uh, coming from a mountain and going to the oceans in the mountainous regions you find a huge huge boulders and as you the slope is decreasing you will find smaller rocks and in the plains you will find the sand in the river bed and after that you will find delta delta is formed due to siltation at the uh, junction of a river and ocean and in the ocean uh, the clay sediments will so there will be deposition and once the water is gone out of there uh, there will be rock formation there's weather materials are deposited the coarser particles settle first finer particles later such deposition known as graded bedding now diagenesis occurs in the final step transformation of unconsolidated sediments unconsolidated means this loose sand silt clay gravels sand silt clay gravel rocks in small small which have been uh broken by weathering so these unconsolidated materials will actually transform the two step process compaction and cementation compaction means layers of materials thousands of tons of layers of materials are being deposited so in the pressure of the above layers the lower layers will be compacted and the any liquid or air will be squished out of them the weight of the upper layers causes compression of the lower layers for deposit sediments consolidate interstitial water and air are squeezed out squished out and some cementing materials for example lime silica iron oxide they, they were already formed during the weathering process they will be in the water and was the water squished out <coughs> some of the cementing material remains and they will cement the layers to form sedimentary rocks 
the four stages of formation of sedimentary rocks please remember whether it's transportation deposition or sedimentation diagenesis diagenesis has two parts two steps compaction and cementation the sedimentary rocks based on mode of origin can be classified as fragmented detrital or mechanically formed formed by the deposition or cementation of erosion products pre existing rocks the resulting rocks may vary in texture structure for example the basia shale conglomerate sands chemically formed they may also be chemically formed for example formed from evaporation or precipitation of material dissolved in sea or lake water for example halite halite means also halogen gypsum and hydrite and hydrite is calcium sulfate without its water limestone dolomite like this <clears throat> less soluble minerals such as gypsum and hydrite are first to precipitate as evaporation progresses more soluble halite is precipitated organically or biochemically formed formed by the accumulation and partial decomposition of organic remains under anaerobic conditions when plants decompose under restricted air supply as it normally happens under such conditions or lower layers of earth a greater portion of the carbon is retained and the material is slowly converted into coal coal basically gives you the peat lignite bituminous uh, semi bituminous anthracite these are all biochemically or organically formed sedimentary rocks so some important sedimentary rocks conglomerate this is shale this is sandstone <coughs> and this is limestone limestone is very important because limestone metamorphosis occurs to form marble formation of metamorphic rocks the changes in the deeply buried rocks are brought about by combined action of chemically active fluids internal heat and pressure in metamorphic rocks the mineral some new minerals are formed due to heat pressure and some chemically active the constituent minerals of the rock are changed into more stable ones that have better structural arrangements suited to the new environment the structure and mineral composition depend on the composition of the original rock as well as the kind of metamorphism certain minerals like these are characteristics of metamorphic rocks so that means if these minerals are present in a rock you can say them metamorphic rocks thermal metamorphism heat is the dominant factor that brings change magma intrusion occurs original rock gets soaked with gaseous or liquid emanations from magma bringing mineral transformation also known as contact or additive metamorphism because addition of magmatic material to the original rock another is dynamo thermal metamorphism combination of pressure and heat both pressure and heat acts leading to more or less complete recrystallization of minerals with new structures associated with mountain building process so this is a very classical example of metamorphosis can you see this granite to this to cysts hello yes sir so granite upon thermal metamorphism converts into gneiss which upon dynamo thermal metamorphism on converts into cysts so gneiss and cysts both are metamorphic rocks granite is a igneous rock So there are some examples. You should remember this: which actually pre-existing rock results into which type of metamorphosis? Very important are the examples of basalt, granite, coal, and limestone. These four are very important. Another very important is shale. Shale converts into slate. <coughs> Metamorphic rocks based on texture and structure. They are three types: foliated. Parallel structure contains mica and pre-magnesian minerals. Shows foliation. Minerals are patterned, arranged in parallel layers. For example, gneiss, schist, pyrite, slate. Non-foliated, massive structure. No lamina, lamination, or uh, parallel structure will be shown. And example, anthracite, talc, schist, and pyrite. Granular, comprising mostly equidimensional grains. Quartzite. And marble, marble comes from which sedimentary rock? Lime. Limestone. Please yes. remember that. Quartz metamorphosis occurs to form quartzite or quartz schist. Probable questions: Which of the following is a basic volcanic rock? Basalt. 
Which of the following rock is porous? Pumice. Pumice. Which of the following is a metamorphic rock? Shell. No. No. Shell is sedimentary. Slate. Shell forms slate. Which of the following is the parent rock of marble? And it. Limestone. Stratification is observed in sandstone. Good. So the final part of today's discussion is weathering of rocks and minerals. Weathering is the physical and chemical alteration of rocks and minerals at or near the surface of earth. The alterations occur because of rocks and minerals are not in equilibrium. Because the rocks and minerals which were formed during the formation of earth they formed in a condition when the temperature and pressure both were much higher than they are now. As the temperature and pressure both have decreased over the time, so they, they are shipped from the equilibrium. They are not in equilibrium with their adjacent environment. As a result, they are constant weathering is going on since time in the air. So this results in disintegration of rocks and decomposition because they are not in equilibrium with the temperature, pressure, and moisture conditions of their environment. This results in disintegration of rocks and decomposition. Disintegration means physical weathering, decomposition is basically chemical weathering. Okay. Please remember this disintegration is physical weathering, decomposition is chemical weathering. This results in disintegration of rocks and decomposition and modification of both primary and secondary layers to form more stable forms, lower free energy in their environment. Weathering three types physical, chemical, biological. Biological is actually a combination of physical and chemical. Brought about by biological agents, okay, agencies like uh, microorganisms, macroorganisms, animals, humans. Like that. Otherwise, the processes actually process actually are physical or chemical. Physical disintegration of rocks without any chemical or mineralogical changes, without any chemical or mineralogical changes, but simply breaking up of rocks into smaller fragments caused by stresses within the rocks from day to night temperature fluctuations. Pressure from freezing of water in small voids in the rocks, pressure from growth of salt crystals and deposits from saline solutions entering cracks, root pressure from the land growth, erosion of overlying materials of rocks, increasing porosity and surface porosity, all these things. So, if the rocks are broken down into pieces without changing their mineralogical or chemical composition, it is physical weathering or disintegration. Chemical weathering, if there is change in the mineralogy or chemical composition due to some reactions, due to some chemical reactions. So chemical decomposition of rocks by changes in the chemical and obliquor, mineralogical composition, most important process in the overall soil. So, you know, chemical weathering is most important among these three. Much more pronounced in tropical, humid and warm areas than in desert, desert arid and hot areas. Hydration, these are the examples, hydration, hydrolysis, solid carbonation, oxidation, reaction. Well, biological soil biological agents are responsible for both disintegration and decomposition. Biological life is largely controlled by their prevailing environment. For example, fungi are more active in warm humid climate. Bacteria are more active in cool humid environments. Outcomes are scarce in acidic environments like theirs. So based on the environment, the biology varies and the biology of the soil, that is biological agents in the soil will have their own bearing on weathering. They will secrete some acid, secrete some uh, ligands, organic ligands in the, and they will cause some chemical reactions. So, one of the processes very simple is solution. Direct dissolution of primary minerals, however, without any chemical change is not common phenomenon. But some substances in rock are soluble in water, which can be removed by flowing or percolating water. Consequently, the rocks develop holes, rings or rough surface, and ultimately paves the way for the chemical weathering processes. So solution of soluble material in a rock actually paves further chemical weathering. The action is accelerated when the water, actually to be water is acidified, wire, not wire, it's water. Water is acidified by dissolution of organic and inorganic acids, resulting calcium carbonate or simple salts like chlorides. These are examples of solution. Calcium carbonate may get dissolved by acidic water. Normal water can also uh, dissolve chlorides. Dissolving calcium carbonate is very important in areas underlain by limestone. Calcium carbonate dissolution accelerates weathering and other soil developmental processes. How? Because if you have enough amount of calcium carbonate somewhere, in that case, the acidic rainwater or any acidic water that is passing through 
will not be able to easily acidify the soil. As a result, uh, there will be less chemical weathering. Once the calcium carbonate is get, gets dissolved, uh, both the dissolution of calcium bearing nickel minerals will be faster, as well as the drop in pH will be faster. As a result, both uh, the chemical hydrolysis and other things will be very much faster. Next is carbonation, combination of CO2 with any base, like you can see, quite effective in decomposing minerals. The process accelerates upon organic matter addition. Carbonated water has an itching effect on some rocks, the limestone, and those containing cementing substances such as conglomerate. You have of cement that holds sand particles together in sandstones or conglomerates leads to their disintegration. Hydration. Next is hydration. That is association of water molecules. Association of water molecules with any anhydrite form. Okay. Hematite, limonite. This calcium sulfate forms gypsum. Association of water molecules or hydroxyl groups with minerals obtained without decomposition of the mineral itself. Okay. Now, this hydrolysis is often considered as the first step in hydrolysis. First, the mineral is attached with water, then it becomes more susceptible to get hydrolyzed. And hydrolysis occurs. Hydrolysis is the most important chemical weathering process. Please remember, hydrolysis is the most important chemical weathering process. In hydrolysis, as you can see here, this K aluminum silicate uh, is being hydrolyzed to form these things. Potassium feldspar, excess of OH minus it will form. Involves attack of silicates by H plus and OH minus bring about changes such as exchange, decomposition, crystalline structure and functional new compounds. Attack of hydronium ion on the interlayer potassium in mica, stripping out many of these atoms to produce elite hydrous mica or completely removing them to form vermiculite. This is one of the hydrolysis reactions. Hydrolysis of aluminum silicates causes disintegration and drastic modification of the kind of mineral. Nuclear minerals being formed by interlayer cation stripping or by the formation of new minerals, weathering products reducing, including resilication of aluminum, which plays. If hydrolysis proceeds rapidly and the weathering products are removed rapidly by perpetual model, deep side can be formed. More commonly, the silicic acid precipitates with alumina to form short range order alumina silicates, crystalline halocytes, nectar, depending on solution activities, silica, alumina, and cations. So, hydrolysis basically changes the entire chemical composition. It breaks down the chemical composition. Some new material comes into the solution, maybe some ions, and directly it may form some cleaners, or it may form some ingredients for. The clay minerals. It may form some ingredients that will again recombine. Resilication of alumina may take place, or re uh, silica formed by this may combine with the alumina, or may uh, there could be the dissolution may also give you calcium, magnesium, all those things. So all those things may combine and give you new synthesis of new minerals, or also there could be alteration, direct alteration uh, through hydrolysis. For example, from mica to vermiculite or vermiculite to smectite, like that. Oxidation, generally oxidation occurs after hydrolysis. Okay. This is oxidation, there is combination with oxygen or loss of electrons of the central atom. It is really oxidation. So FeO oxidizes into Fe2O3, Fe3O4 oxidizes into Fe2O3. Reduction under waterlogged conditions, oxygen deprived conditions, oxidized minerals can get reduced from ferric to ferrous. Now, this oxidation reaction process are most common in minerals which have atoms with variable oxidation numbers, for example, iron, manganese, and sulfur. Chelation this is actually a part of the chemical uh, weathering process where different ligands organic or inorganic ligands, they form coordinate covalent bond with the metal that has been released into the of the rock. So what will happen, say a rock is being weathered, the metal is being released, that metal will be captured by this organic ligand. As a result, this metal, though they will, it will be present in the solution, but it will not be in the equilibrium with the solid phase itself. As a result, this chelation actually will aggravate the dissolution of the original rock. 
this is basically chelation. Chelate means claw. This is claw, like like a claw. It is holding the metal, and this yes. is basically the ligand. Yes. This is based on quantity and intensity factor. Oh no, <laughs> not quantity intensity. Quantity intensity is basically in quantity intensity you do not have chelates. Okay. Quantity intensity is also like that. That, that is uh, equilibrium between solid phase and solution phase. Okay, but this is uh, not exactly quantity intensity. Say you have a rock, which is made up of say aluminium or iron. It has iron and aluminium. If in the system, if the rock is present in adjacent to a solution which contains excess of aluminium, then it will not. Get dissolved easily to release more of aluminium because already the solution adjacent to it has sufficient aluminium. Okay, so somewhat it is like quantity intensity because if intensity is excess, then the uh, solid phase will not release potassium like that. If the intensity of the mineral of that ion or so solution activity of a particular ion is high in the solution adjacent to the solid phase, then that solid phase will not easily dissolve to release that metal. Okay, but once these are getting chelated, they will remain in solution. They will be solubilized. They, you can determine it in double S or something, but it will not be in equilibrium. That means it cannot go back to the solid phase because if you want, if it wants to go back, it will it it will have to take all these large moiety and moiety, which is not possible. So the activity. So concentration will be high. Activity of free uh, metal ion will be less. As a result, it will actually accelerate, facilitate the stripping of metal ions from primary minerals and their translocation. The, this in this form, it can also get translocated from one place to another through water. In quantity intensity, what happens? You are continuously removing the potassium from the system, a by plant extraction. Okay. You are not abiding. Uh, there could be chelation by the organic anions providing by the provided by the plants. That is another thing. But you are continually removing the potassium by say leaching or say plant uptake. And in that case, your intensity will drop and quantity will release some of the potassium to just balance, buffer it. But in this case, what will happen? This will not be able to go back, and this will not end the feedback inhibition. As a result, more of Keeping of metal will occur. So finally, this is a series. I will not describe much. This series actually is a Bowen reaction series, Bowen reaction series for crystallization of primary minerals. Please remember the series for crystallization of primary minerals is Bowen reaction series. It has two branches: discontinuous ferromagnesian branch, continuous feldspar branch. Okay. And as per this. Quartz is much more stable than oligoclase. Zeolites are even more stable. Hydrothermal minerals are most stable. Least stable olivine. Like that. So increasing silicate linkage indicative of greater SiO SI bonding. The geochemical properties associated with lower temperature stability. If you go upward, temperature formation. That means these minerals have formed in a temperature which is much higher than the formation of these minerals. As these minerals have formed in lower temperature. They are more stable in current climatic conditions, low temperature. These minerals have formed in very high temperatures, so they are much less stable in nowadays. But if you compare between these two branches, feldspars are way more stable than olivine, pyroxene, and people like that because of the oxygen sharing. Oxygen sharing in feldspar is much more as compared to these. In olivine, there is no oxygen sharing. Pyroxene, two oxygens. And people's two and three alternatively, biotite three, and biotite also contains iron in ferrous form, so it may get oxidized and make get problems. So these are more stable than these, and these the below minerals are more stable than the above minerals. Okay, so the geometric properties associated with low temperature stability are increasing silicate linkage. If the silicate linkage is more, they are more stable right now. Increasing replacement of silicon silicon by aluminium in this discontinuous series. If silicon by aluminium ratio decreases in the discontinuous series, then they are uh, actually they become more stable. 
because it occurs in case of test cars. If it increases, the aluminium concentration increases, then it becomes more stable. Increasing replacement of silicon by aluminium in the discontinuous series, decreasing replacement of silicon by aluminium in continuous series. Increasing sodium potassium content related to aluminium and related to calcium and magnesium. They are they are indicative of stability. This is of OH minus H minus ions in the structure. They are all indicative of more stability, like now. The stability of at where uh, earth surface conditions it is increasing from up to down. Temperature of formation it is increasing from down to up. Now this is for clay minerals. This indicates the development of soil stage. The stages of soil development as indicated by the presence of clay minerals. Remember by Jackson and Sherman, 1953. Clay mineral association in soils are seen as indicators of the degree of soil development. Now, a soil that has vermiculite elite is much more weathered than a soil which is dominantly containing calcite, olomite, apatite like this. So these are the basically the weathering stages. As we progress through the weathering stages, you will find these kind of minerals. But it does not mean that gypsum will convert into quartz. Okay, it does not mean that. Muscovite may convert into, or say biotite may convert into vermiculite. Vermiculite may convert into elite, or say, no, sorry, bio biotite will convert into vermiculite. Vermiculite will convert into smectite. Smectite may convert into kaolinite. Like that, vermiculite will smectite will into kaolinite. Then kaolinite may convert into gypsite. But does not mean that quartz will convert into muscovite. No, it is not like that. So this actually shows that soil development stage. If you have soils with more of oxides, corundums are from these things, then the soil is very advanced stage and very advanced stage of the deep site. It is also very advanced stage of the deep. If the soil is mostly dominated by mica, chlorides, etc., it is here at the soil development stage is poor. Now, what is important from exam point of view? The stage for muscovite or quartz or sesnectites, they may ask these stages, but this question may not come in GRF, but may come in SRF and ERS exams. Okay. The GRF question may be, what is the sequence of uh, stability of clay size minerals, given by Jackson or something Bowen? In that case, you have to write Jackson. It's also called the Jackson series, indicating weathering index of clay size minerals, or Jackson and Salmon sequence. This may be asked for clay minerals. And for primary minerals, it is Bowen series. Before that, Gold is 1938, they, he also uh, gave a stability series for primary minerals. Okay. Stability series for primary and primary minerals, it, it is only asked when Gold is. If temperature or condition of crystallization, sequence of crystallization of primary minerals, Bowen series. Weathering index of clay size minerals, Jackson series. Okay, like that, these questions may, ask, may be asked in GRM. But in ARS, they may ask what is the soil development stage would be if muscovite is a dominant mineral. Okay. In that case, you have to write seven. Or at weathering stage 10, which of the following element will be present? You will have sacaolinite, feldspar, like that. In the, you have to write kaolinite. So you have to prepare a mimonicon for this and you have to remember this, at least for the SRF and ARS exams. Okay. So, probable questions, most important chemical weathering processes? Hydrolysis. Which of the following is least resistant to weathering? Quartz. Least olivine. resistant? Olivine. Yeah, olivine, olivine. Which of the following is associated with soil development stage 7? Muscovite. Good. Chemical weathering is most pronounced in which climate? Hot and humid. Hot and humid. High diurnal temperature variation leads to physical weathering. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thanks to the team of MPKB Rahuri for giving me this opportunity. If you have any question, you can ask regarding this. Sir, uh, one question. Uh, what is the difference between clay mineral and clay sized mineral? Yeah, this is very important question. Very, very, very important. Clay minerals are generally secondary minerals, which are formed due to weathering of primary minerals. And they must be clay sized, no doubt. But clay sized secondary minerals are mostly called as clay minerals. But in clay sized minerals, for the clay minerals example, clay minerals example are says mectite, kaolinite, elite, vermiculite. 
and also the oxides if they are present in the clay size fraction because they have formed due to decomposition. Clay sized minerals, in clay sized minerals, not only the clay minerals will be there, but also quartz, mica, these primary minerals may get, say, muscovite, especially the muscovite, because biotite, when it is broken down to clay sized fraction, it, it gets changed into its, its chemical form changes, it gets weathered, decomposed. But muscovite mica is very resistant, quartz is very resistant. If they even get disintegrated into clay sized fraction, they will retain their actual structure. So they are actually clay sized primary minerals, not clay minerals. Okay. Sand and silt mostly contain primary minerals. Clay particles mostly contain secondary minerals. But does not mean that in sand and size fractions, there could not be any clay mineral. That means only any secondary mineral. In sand and size fractions, there could be secondary minerals also. And in clay size fractions, there could be primary minerals also. Anything else? Any other no yet. Yes, hello. Hello. Sir, uh, please repeat once again. Sir. Which one? Uh, this last the, final one. Yes, sir. Okay. Clay sized mineral and clay mineral. Clay minerals are basically those minerals which are clay sized as well as which are secondary. Okay. Formed by weathering of primary minerals. For example, smectite, elite. Vermiculite, teolinite, haloisite, and, and, yeah, my okay. and, say clay, and also clay sized, and also clay sized oxides and hydroxides. Got it? Now, clay sized minerals. In clay sized minerals, not only these clay secondary minerals will be present, but in clay sized minerals, some primary minerals could also be present. For example, quartz, muscovite, as they are very resistant to chemical weathering, even when they are disintegrated to below 2 micron size, that means disintegrated to clay size fractions, they can retain their chemical nature for a long time. So they are actually not clay minerals, but they are clay size minerals when they are present in the clay size fraction. Though quartz and muscovite will be mainly present in the sand and silt, but they can also be present in clay sized fractions because they will persist in there. Other minerals, if they're broken down into clay sized fractions, they will change their chemical form because as we broken down from large size to smaller size, the specific surface area increases, points of contact of chemical reaction increases, and if a particular mineral is not that much resistant chemically, then when its size is in the clay range, it will change its chemical form through chemical reactions. So, in clay sized fractions, you may also find quartz and muscovite, which are not actually clay minerals. Okay, sir. Why black soil shows swelling on? Water addition? Due to expansion. Due to expansion, which type of mineral is present here? Mount Morillonite. Uh, actually, smectitic minerals are present. In India, black soils are smectitic. Smectite is a group of minerals, group of ex twist one expanding type minerals. Mount Morillonite is a particular type of smectite. Okay? Smectite. It is, uh, if, if your question is like that, which of the following minerals are most dominant in black soils of India? And uh, there is option smectite and there is option montpolonite. You will write smectite. Okay. Because in India, mostly bidelite is more dominant than montpolonite. And both bidelite and montpolonite, as well as some other smectites, are also there, which are present. So not only montpolonite is present. Okay. So if the question comes, you, smectite is a better option. 
it's nectar is not there okay. it, the, the doctors are like contolorite kaolinite can say quartz or something then you write contolorite okay thank you sir so should i end here then uh, i have taken 21 minutes extra sorry for that Where is the host? Hello, sir. I am audible, uh, sir. Yes, yes, yes. You are audible. Uh, oh. I have actually uh, I am done with uh, the lecture as well as the question answers. So I think we can end here. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, thank you, sir, uh, giving this precious lecture to the, all of the students. I hope, sir, all the students have benefited with all these things and can clear this con uh, basic concept of soil science, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, behalf of the sir, uh, head of department, behalf of the sir, division of soil science uh, in the MPK Virauri and the course coordinator and advisor, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me here. So I will send the uh, presentation to you uh, via mail after okay. this class. Okay. Uh, so let us end here then. Should I leave? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I call you, sir, in five minutes.